Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And we are a teaching center that focuses on hands-on courses to improve your skills and knowledge in restorative dentistry. And today we have the final part of the ceramic series and this is going to be on the cementation of that inlay and onlay that we did in the previous videos. So the case is back from the lab and these are pressed ceramic restorations. These are Emacs and these restorations were made from the lost wax process where they were waxed up and carved, fitted to the dies and then they were invested and pressed. They could have been milled and they could have been done from virtual models but in this case we did them more traditionally. Let's talk about some of the equipment you're going to need to have for this procedure and this is the micro etcher system that I use and the components, I'll discuss these in more detail in just a second, but this one's called a Micro Etcher 2A. This particular Micro Etcher is uh, really handy. It's not that expensive. It's made by Zest Dental and is distributed by Danville Materials here in California. And it comes uh, in this little case. I've put these little stickers on there. Those are my logo because I am in a group practice and I want to make sure that my stuff is well labeled and uh, it has a cord that comes with it for the, the, the air hose. And uh, in this particular case, it has a nice metal tip. They have different types of tips available. I like this particular one and a push button. So you push on the rheostat and then push the button. Out comes all of the sandblast material, the media that we use. And it's pretty simple uh, to utilize. You need to just uh, take this little receptacle here and fill this with aluminum oxide. I happen to like using 50 micron aluminum oxide. Once again, this is by Zest Dental Solutions. And filling this uh, with this particular product, you have 27 micron in, in sizes that are larger, but all in all, I think that the 50 micron size uh, seems to work uh, quite well. And it's relatively inexpensive. So I think this is a, a system that every dental office should have. It's great for cleaning out uh, debris in restorations before you cement them and in the case of the immediate dentin sealing technique we need to lightly sandblast the surface that we've sealed in the previous step. So we're going to go ahead and insert this little siphon that goes down into the uh, little cap that you can screw on and then you're pretty much good to go except that this tube here needs to somehow fit into your air system and you can purchase a little adapter it's made by different company and you can take the tube and go ahead and insert it on this little barbed tip at the end. There are other systems that allow you to connect it to uh, your unit more directly but I like this particular system because I can just put it into my handpiece hose and uh, have it handy right there on the bracket table for use. Let me show you how uh, easy this is to use. I'm going to take a United States penny and uh, I'm just going over the surface and you can see how quickly this will remove the luster off of this coin and the thing that's kind of cool about this is that there's just not a lot of debris so what I'm doing here is I'm scraping up the material and showing you that there's very little material that's wasted or that would get all over the patient in this particular case. Pretty simple. Let's talk about the uh, etching procedure and the materials I like to use. This is a hydrofluoric acid etch, 9.5%. We can use 5%, 4.5%. And with lithium disilicate, the etch time is 20 seconds, regardless of the strength of the, of the etch. I use this for the tooth. This is the phosphoric acid, 32% with benzoconium chloride, which helps to kill bugs. I like to use a two-bottle silane system. There are great one-bottle silane systems out there, but I like a two-bottle. IvoClean, which is a cleaning paste. We're going to show you how to use that. And then we're going to use uh, whatever bonding system you like to use, whether it be a universal, a fifth or fourth generation. This is a, a two-part system that gets mixed together before it's applied to the tooth. Rubber dam uh, has been mentioned in other videos, but I thought I'd go over uh, this procedure again in case you haven't seen that. Uh, this particular product is uh, definitely my favorite and I've been using this now for many many years and it's quite popular. It's available in black as well which is uh, kind of cool if you want to take some photography. The black uh, has got a really really nice look to it. 
In, the, in this particular case, we are going to be isolating a maxillary rubber dam, so we want to go one inch from the top of the rubber dam, and that will be the location for your central, and then you just go ahead off at an angle, and then change your angle slightly as you go to the premolar, premolar, molar, and molar. And I don't like using the uh, those stamps or those guides. I think that you just get used to uh, marking the holes uh, based on what the arch looks like. And sometimes you'll have a missing tooth or you'll have a tooth that's out of alignment. And it's good to just know how to freehand this. The holes should be about the width of a mirror handle apart from each other. So uh, let's measure that and see exactly what that is just to give us a little bit better idea. And I liked to use the metric system and this is a five millimeter spacing between the holes and I'm showing here a five hole punch. I think these are fine. Uh, the smallest hole perhaps for anterior premolars, premolar here, maybe large premolars for that middle hole and then the largest for molar teeth with clamps on them and the second largest would be maybe just for molar teeth. I'm just going to use three of the hole sizes here. The smallest hole for the anterior teeth and make sure you have a nice clean hole. It doesn't have a little a portion that's still stuck on there because as you rip off that little center part you can leave a little edge that will lead to a tear later on. This happens to be a medium weight rubber dam and that happens to be my favorite for the vast majority of restorative cases. So this is the quadrant uh, that we are going to restore, uh, the two molars actually, and we'll start by putting the rubber dam on the clamped tooth. I like to put the clamp on first and not simultaneously. I just find that it's easier to play the place the clamp atraumatically and more comfortably for the patient if I can see that. And then I'm just doing the knifing through technique. Obviously this is very, very easy because we're dealing with extracted teeth that are mounted in a type on rather loosely and, and it would be great if they're all this easy, but after some practice, I found that a lot of times in the mouth of a patient, they do go this easy. Uh, but uh, sometimes they're really, really difficult. And rubber dam application can take you maybe three, four minutes rather than just 30, 40 seconds or so. So I'm going to go ahead and get that tight contact by flossing against the tooth and not pushing the rubber dam down, but sliding the, the floss through the space between the tooth and the rubber dam and not smashing it down through the rubber dam itself. And you can see that there, uh, the rubber dam nearly inverts itself. I don't find any need whatsoever to ligate. I know that that's been a popular technique advocated on the internet, but I think it's overkill. And certainly if you understand how to blow air as you're using a fine instrument like an Explorer, not a, not a large, thick instrument but something really delicate like this where you can just push along the side of the tooth very gently and you can flip the rubber dam over into the sulcus everting it uh, pretty nicely. That distal of that of that first molar isn't exactly the way I'd like it so I noticed that after I taped this that that would not be uh, the way I'd typically like it but the mesial of the molar looks pretty good. So that's essentially uh, how we place the rubber dam and I'm just going to lightly sandblast the surface. This is the IDS technique. We lightly abrade the surface just to remove any debris that's there. The dentin's already sealed. It's already taken care of. We're not going to need to worry about acid etching the dentin and, and trying to reestablish a bond from scratch. We've already got that dentin sealed and we're relying on the peripheral seal of the enamel to provide us with the ultimate seal of these restorations. A little Teflon tape on the premolar. We're gonna go ahead and try in the, uh, these pressed ceramic restorations and see if they fit reasonably well. Uh, it's just never quite as good as the fit of gold. I find that gold restorations uh, can be made to fit within five microns where we don't quite get that accuracy, but not to worry, we're going to be able to create this continuous seal from the ceramic to the tooth with the technique I'm showing you. This is IvoClean. After you've tried them in, you've got debris, you've got saliva, those salivary glycoproteins and what have you all over these. Even if the rubber dam's in place, you're going to have some debris there. So all this is is just a cleaning paste and it's got some zirconia particles in it. Uh, this should never be used in the mouth. Don't ever put this on teeth. Don't ever expose your patients to this. It is not good for them. Let's go ahead and just use this away from the patient and just scrub it on the surfaces uh, that you're going to be bonding of, uh, of your uh, inlays and your onlay. 
and then you're going to rinse it off and you can blow it dry. Now let's turn our attention back over the teeth. We are going to etch the periphery and uh, beyond. Uh, I'd like to go about two, millime two millimeters beyond the, the margin. Here I'm a little bit conservative, so go ahead and, and add a little bit more material and get it all the way around. I'm going to just etch both of them at this time. If you want to just etch one at a time and just treat this as a single tooth at a time situation, I think that makes a lot of sense too. Uh, certainly if you're new to doing this, I would take this in much smaller pieces rather than trying to do everything at once. So the restorations are not very uh, characterized. Uh, I think that this is kind of more typical dentistry. It's not the exotic, beautiful, deep fissures and stained areas, but I think these are going to look pretty good. So here we have uh, the peripheries, and I'm just highlighting that because the, the, these corners between the internal or the intaglio of the restoration and the external, I am going to etch that edge. These have already been pre-etched by the laboratory. And uh, I don't ever teach them how to do this etching step that I'm going to be showing you here. I do this myself. And I etch the edges, okay? Now, it's already been etched on the internal, but I'm going to etch the edges plus about half to one millimeter all the way around. And that way, the cement will be able to bond to that rounded corner a little bit better. And it, this is a technique that Ed McLaren showed me many years ago. And it's just been fantastic to minimize the, the groove uh, sort of discoloration staining effect that you get sometimes with uh, restorations. So silane, I happen to like to use a two bottle silane. I think it's completely okay to use a one bottle silane, uh, but you gotta be really careful about shelf life in that particular situation. So we wanna mix up the acid with the, with the silane in order to create the hydrolysis, replace those methyl groups with the OH groups, and then activate this silane molecule, which is going to be uh, able to link the ceramic, which is very hydrophilic, to the resin, which is hydrophobic. It's a bipolar molecule. And once we cover the surface, don't just keep adding more and more, but just add one nice, you know, liberal layer and then stop. Don't go back and keep adding more and more. Uh, some people are confused about what the surface should look like after you've properly silanated. After you've properly silanated and you've waited five minutes, the surface should look matte. You should not have a shiny surface. This is proper silanation. If the surface looks shiny, you have probably added too much. This is the Addent uh, composite warmer, and it can be, uh, it's called the Calset uh, warmer, and they have different types of attachments. You can do all kinds of warming of composite. And I think this is a reasonable way to go about cementation. Uh, we put the composite cartridge in here. It could be uh, put in the middle. Sometimes that just works great because it gets a lot of heat and it warms up really nicely. And we uh, turn it up to as hot as it'll go. This is the, the highest uh, setting. Uh, it has a low and a medium setting as well. You know, whatever bonding system you're going to use, you want to make sure you understand that uh, the system needs to be used according to the manufacturer's recommendations. In this case, I'm using a two-part system that actually is mixed up in the well and then applied to the tooth after thorough mixing. I like to put a little bit on the inside or the intaglio of the restorations and then make sure we allow this to air dry to volatilize all the solvent. This is really critical because this can interfere with adhesion. After we've coated the surfaces, we'll go ahead and turn our attention to the uh, teeth that we're going to be bonding. And we're just applying the material here to the uh, premolar. I'm going to put a little bit of protection against the, the cement from uh, getting onto the adjacent tooth. And then we're going to go ahead at this point and utilize the warm composite technique. And the composite oozes out a little bit more uh, quickly than we're perhaps used to. And that's what we should be looking for. You can damp this down and sort of make it more even too, but you have to work quickly. It's amazing how fast the composite will start to firm up on you. So you have to move really fast. And it's a little bit more difficult to use the warm composite than it is to use a uh, less viscous product that would be made for the purpose of cementation. Uh, one of the universal resin cements, for example, or uh, any of the resin cements that are available would be a lot easier uh, first method to use, I would say. 
We're using just a little bit of adhesive or modeling resin to remove uh, any of the additional composite that's uh, worked its way out. And I like this without tack curing uh, because I can get a nice smooth continuation. After curing this uh, for 20 seconds per surface, three times over, now we're ready to move on to the cementation of the molar. And I'm just applying the bonding material onto the entire surface, keeping in mind that we're really looking for that peripheral seal with enamel. This is a little uh, trick that I've picked up along the way, and you can take uh, the tip of a composite compule, put it onto a condenser, like an amalgam condenser, and after you're seeding this with a lot of pressure, and onlays take a lot of pressure to get all of that uh, composite out of there, you can now push with this instrument and not worry about scraping the uh, restoration with something hard and, and metal, but it works really, really well. Don't give up, just keep pushing. You'll be surprised and you think, oh, I've got this completely seated and you just cleave off the cement. It comes off so clean. It's such a nice way to work uh, with uh, delivering bonded ceramics because you have very little cleanup to do. And now I can take the instrument and push again and watch this, the, the composite come out. Look at that, look at it oozing out. I mean, you really have to put your shoulder into it. Uh, don't be wimpy, get the darn thing seated all the way and uh, you may have to go back and just keep pushing, but miraculously, it just keeps oozing out. When you know that there's no more material coming out from the interface between the restoration and the tooth, then you're ready to uh, stop at that point, clean up uh, the, the edges, and then go back to the uh, unfilled resin or filled resin or modeling resin, whatever you choose, just to smooth that transition, much in the same way you would with like a class five restoration, so that you have this seamless connection between the ceramic and the tooth structure. I haven't cured yet. I haven't tack cured. I don't like tack curing. I'm utilizing here more of a super floss material to remove some of the composite that would be trapped in approximately. I'm double checking. I'm cleaning. I clean uh, meticulously uh, before I decide to light cure. And then we go into the curing mode. Once again, 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 20 seconds, facial occlusal and lingual and you can even get the mesial if you're like on that uh, second molar that we did and you do that three times so you have a total of 60 seconds per surface and the restorations are now cured and they're ready for finishing so let's take off the rubber dam and let's evaluate occlusion and do our adjustments there I'll talk about occlusion I promise in a future video because that is such a great topic these are intraoral adjusters. This happens to be a, kind of a universal system made by Brassler. It's great for all kinds of ceramic. However, if you want to be a little more sophisticated, you can get a system just like this from Brassler or other companies. There are many uh, for lithium disilicate and also one for zirconia, should you so desire. So after uh, utilizing this uh, from left to right, here the final result. Not bad. They're, they're not flawless, but they turned out decent. I like the seamless connection on that molar from the, the restoration to the tooth. So, whew, wow, we're done. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for lots more videos. I promise one per week. Thanks everybody, take care.